it's almost half past, so I think we can start uh, with the next presentation, uh, which is of representing ideology in terminology, terminological knowledge basis, and it's going to be uh, presented by Ariane Reimerink and uh, Pilar Leon. Sorry. Ooh. Now, now it's on. Is that better? Can you still hear me? Ooh. Um, so what we did was um, search for uh, excerpts with combinations of climate plus noun in English, such as climate change, climate emergency, climate breakdown, climate catastrophe, climate cataclysm, and uh, also with noun and climatico in Spanish, of cambio climatico, which is literally uh, climate change, crisis climatica, amenaza climatica, etc. And then we annotated those in a spreadsheet, an Excel sheet, um, with the frames of Bolson and Shapiro. I'm giving some examples so you get an idea of how we did that framing. Um, for example, the economic consequences frame uh, can be considered positive or negative. Um, 
normally uh, they would, especially in the beginning of uh, when people started talking about climate change, was that to do something about it would be very bad for the economy. And then later on, they actually looked at the more positive economic consequences in the sense that it would be a challenge that would uh, create new technologies and create new jobs, which is an, one of the politicians here is actually focusing on. He says, one of the frustrations that many of us feel is that tackling fuel, po fuel poverty by investing in energy efficiency can really be a win-win situation in getting people's fuel bills down, tackling climate change and creating jobs. So we would frame that, we would annotate that with the frame of economic consequences plus. The morality ethics frame, for example, is normally related um, in the media, when Dawson and Shapiro define it for the US media, is when they talked about um, uh, religious leaders intervening and talking to their audiences about climate change, more in the sense of, we've been given this earth by God, so we have to take care of it. But we have used it mostly when they were talking about, um, we have to take care of the earth for future generations which is mentioned quite often, in, as well as the English and the Spanish uh, debates. A little less in the Spanish ones, I believe. Um, political conflict, of course, in parliamentary debates, uh, everything is political conflict. And that caused a, a bit of a problem, because we could frame everything as political conflict. Everything could be annotated in that way. So when there was another frame present, we decided to uh, make that a preference. Here's an example. You can see... Does my right honorable friend agree that a vital part of the debate about how to address climate change is our energy consumption? No? And then they say, in that context, people in Twickenham are very aware of the three R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle. So they're taking an example of people um, that are doing things themselves, self-efficacy in the sense that uh, what can you do to mitigate climate change? Okay, that's what the definition is of this frame. And then he goes back to, I do not have one, this says about meters. I do not see a smart meter here. I do not have one in my office. How is the rollout of smart meters going? So that's really talking to some member of the government saying, okay, there are some people doing it okay, but you're doing it completely wrong. No? Still, we then preferred to annotate it with the frame of self-efficacy. Efficacy is a bit of a, well, at least I think it's a bit difficult because uh, Bolsonaro Shapiro defines self-efficacy which is basically what anyone in the public can do to mitigate uh, climate change. But there's also external efficacy. It's like, what can the industries or the universities or you know, like institutions do? And then there is what the government can do, and which is called response efficacy. Okay, that's it. So you have a slight idea of what the differences are. Um, when there were several frames in one intervention, you know, politicians have a tendency to talk quite long as academics do, actually. And um, we would, if we could, we would divide them up. It wasn't always possible because sometimes, you know, they're all mixed up. But this is an example where we could easily divide up the intervention and turn this one into three ones. So the first one was identified as scientific consensus, positive. or the existence of climate Although there are certain fractions that maybe downtone it a little bit or said, we know that this is an emergency, but. No? Um, so in this mm, first section, they uh, refer to climate change is real and we are responsible for it, so scientific consensus plus. Then the next section, um, we have in our hands the ingenuity to tackle the problem. So that's a, you know, we can response efficacy, saying that the government can actually do something about it. And then they refer to uh, responsibilities to hold the planet in trust for future generations. So that part was then annotated as morality ethics. Um, a few new frames came up that weren't in the original list of uh, Wilson and Shapiro. One was uh, a hopeful one. We had doubts here because um, we called it political consensus. And we started out annotating it as political conflict as well, because really the definition of political conflict is not as much uh, 
then telling each other they're doing things wrong, but more using the topic for um, political issues, not as much saying, let's do something about it. But there is some political consensus as well. Actually, I think from the 500 in the English parliamentary debates, there were 24 that actually talked about all of us together now agree on having to do something about this. For example, I hear one of the uh, politicians says, I pay tribute to the effort and I'm grateful to colleagues from all parties for their support for the bill. Mm -hmm. And another one that came up was the call for action frame, we've called it, because you know the, many politicians that stand up say, we have to do, not just we have to do something, many times it's we have to do more. Mm -hmm. And we, we define those as call for action. Let us make sure that our recovery is a green recovery, for example. That was after the, the, uh, the current crisis they referred to uh, the COVID pandemic. And there was another frame which is not interesting at all, and we call it neutral. And sometimes climate change just comes up in conversation and they don't really talk about the topic. So we mentioned that as neutral just to make sure that we wouldn't um, change the, the, um, the relative importance of the other frames. Here, for example, I speak as a former chair of flood risk management Wales, responsible for reducing Wales to climate change in terms of blah, blah, blah. He's just introducing himself. And then what he actually said afterwards had absolutely nothing to do with climate change. And now um, Pilar is taking the floor to talk about the actual results and the numerical results of our annotation. And I'll turn this off just for a second while we... Maybe? Can you hear me now? Is it right? I, I'd rather do, the, do it this way. Um, so, yeah. So, these are a few um, quantitative data about um, how um, political discourse is framed um, around climate change, right? Climate change and all of the different term variants that we found referring to the same phenomenon of climate change. Um, these are the general trends. We can see that um, response efficacy plus, response efficacy minus, uh, political conflict and morality ethics were the frames mostly, most frequently found in um, UK uh, political discourse. Of course, we can see that there's a different proportion. The trends uh, regarding response efficacy uh, minus and plus are um, completely the, the opposite for the Labour and the Conservative Party. So, so response efficacy is like the, the big issue in, in UK. Um, in contrast, in, in Spanish political discourse, um, we have response efficacy plus as the most frequently activated frame. Um, and response efficacy minor is actually the fourth um, frame activated. So we can see here that Spanish politicians are actually quite happy with how their policies work regarding climate change, and they are most concerned about fighting with each other. <laughs> the second most frequently found uh, frame is political conflict, um, and and actually it is activated in, by all of the different parties. The different parties have been some of them have been regrouped together. Like we have a lot of regional nationalistic parties, and they, we have group them according to left wing or right wing, right? So we can see that in political conflict and in response efficacy plus, all of the parties agree to give it like uh, salience enough. Um, and in contrast with uh, British political discourse, we can see that disaster and morality ethics are quite, um, um, I mean, are not very often activated as compared to British political discourse. Um, so, yeah, we can see, I mean, this is something we know that in Spanish parliament, politicians are arguing with each other with, mm, constantly, even more. <laughs> than, um, here we can see the same data, but disaggregated uh, according to the different parties. And we can see how each of these parties um, give more attention to different frames. For example, conservatives um, are, I mean, as compared to the rest of the parties, 
activate the frames, the economic frames, more often than the rest. And it is, uh, I mean, they they activate the economic consequences minor uh, minus frame more often than the positive ones, but it's but still the positive frame is activated more often than in, by the rest of the parties. Then liberals, for example, are more concerned about uh, call for action and disaster than the rest of the parties. And I mean, well, quite similar to, to, to labor. And here we can see clearly the, how the response efficacy frame, positive and negative sides, are completely opposite in labor and conservative. And of course, the Green Party is um, um, also I mean, this is the, the frame, except for conservatives, the, the response efficacy um, minus frame. Um, we can see that, um, for example, recent party, they are they usually create political conflict and they are the ones that uh, actually activate the scientific consensus minus um, frame which is they actually doubt about the existence or not the existence uh, okay <laughs> not the existence but the importance of climate change together with uh, the regional left parties also activate this frame but only to accuse uh, some of the parties to demeaning the importance of climate change, right? Um, also, anyway, since we don't have a lot of time, I'm going <laughs> to go through uh, the correlation between frames and temporarians. And for example, here we can see that how climate cl cataclysm, there's a certain association between uh, different variants, such as cataclysm. Um, it is usually activated when activating the, the frames disaster and political conflict. In this case, we're actually talking quite literally. The politicians talk about a, a real cataclysm, and when used in the political conflict, they use they use it as a mockery, kind of thing. It's um, it's like exaggerating reality. They usually use it to attack other parties who seem to be uh, very alarm alarmist. Uh, but of course, we can see that climate emergency and crisis are the most frequently found um, variants and related to virtually all different frames. The same as in Spanish, where we mostly use uh, crisis climatica and emergencia climatica, but also some other more extreme variants, such as amenaza climatica, lit literally uh, climatic uh, threat, which is used to talk about national security. So it makes quite a bit of sense. I mean, it means quite a bit of sense when talking about framing and conceptualizing and how to influence uh, readers. So when we talk about national security, so it, it is logical that you use the word threat. And also climate, climate apoca apocalypse, we also uh, use this in the form of a mockery to deny scientific, the scientific consensus around climate change. There's also some tendencies that we found uh, regarding left-wing and right-wing parties. We can see that, for example, there's a higher variability of term variants used by left parties, maybe because they like to nuance their interventions. Um, and we also see how from 2019, um, we start using um, the, word, the, the term climate emergency because both in Spanish and British parliaments, uh, they, they declare the climate emergency uh, state, let's say. So from that moment onwards, the, the climate emergency term uh, was mostly used. Um, here is, we have exactly the same da uh, data regarding Spanish politicians. And so finally, uh, she, uh, again, Ariane is going to talk about how, what we do with this data when representing ideology in, lexical, uh, in terminological resources. The question is how, why, I mean, should lexicographers be truly invisible or maybe give some hints? Uh, yeah, that, that the idea is no, um, how objective uh, are we, how objective do we want to be? And actually we've decided that we want to, of course, reflect scientific reality, but we also want to frame for climate change mitigation. Our, uh, our TKB um, is for um, experts, um, semi-experts such as translators and, and technical writers, and also for, um, for lay 
uh, audience. No, the people want to learn about the topic. And especially for those lay audience, we want people to actually understand the concept in such a way that they might actually change behavior and do something. So our proposal is based on scientific consensus. So give specific data, adapted to the audience, specific information for our specific users, and use Okay, we'll try again. Um, and, um, use, and use frames that uh, create a change in behavior, according to previous literature, of course. We haven't invented this. Uh, which are the self-efficacy frames and also frame for hope. No, there's still something you can do. And value frames. No, how should we, is it more, more related to morality and ethics? Um, this is our web, uh, this is our uh, TKB, Ecolexicon it's called. It has, um, it has, wait a second, it has um, a semantic network in the middle. It has a definition here, then it has a different term variants. It has resources with images and then conceptual categories, etc. I won't get into too much detail. So we, uh, then we here, and what we've done is that this was the previous definition we had for climate change, which is very, very neutral, not long-term changes in temperature. Uh, and other aspects of the Earth's climate in response to physical feedbacks, chemical feedbacks, etc., caused by humans and nature. No, very flat definition. And now we're saying, okay, our definition is a lot longer, but we're putting in frames that might help. So it's long-term uh, changes in the Earth's climate, and although it can be the result of natural causes, such as change in the sun's activity or volcanic eruptions, the acceleration of the past two centuries is due to human activities. Mostly the burning of fossil fuels that increase greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, its effects include, now, now we're going for the disaster frame, drafts, water scarcity, severe fires, etc. And it will lead to problems for human health and migration. Human health, public health frame, which is usually effective, and migration to put a little, a little bit of the national security frame. And then we try to create some hope in the end, saying policies, individual measures, such as transport, food, and energy use choices can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and mitigate the process. So, okay, the definition is long, but it's a complex concept. So our idea is that, you know, if you're interested, please read until the end. Um, now, in the same uh, part of our concept module, we also use concept notes. And uh, that's where we m give more explanations to technical writers, maybe, or translators saying, okay, if you um, want to frame for certain things, use this, use that. You know? In political discourse, climate change is mostly portrayed as part of the response efficacy frame. In Spain, political conflict and conflict extra and next frames more frequently activated, et cetera, et cetera. And oh, they're asking me to end, I'm sorry. We have a whole thing about images as well. If you're interested, during the coffee break, <laughs> we're happy to explain. help the reader to understand the complexity of the concept. 
So here we've given specific data about temperature change, no real data, and focusing on the scientific consensus. Here we have the disaster frame. The disaster frame, the, the problem with the disaster frame is that, of course, there are terrible consequences, but people think, oh, it's going to be terrible, there's nothing I can do. So it leads to inaction. So we have to combine them with other ones. And this is an image of a specific place in China. You might think, yeah, but that's very distant for many users. So what we thought is, okay, if you register, which is something you can do in Ecolexicon, they can understand where you register from, and they will give you um, images of disastrous situations in your own region, okay? So if you're, go you're going from China, you see this, and if you um, registering from California, you'll see a wildfire there in California. Um, and I think I'm going to the end because this one is a really nice one as well, very good one for self-efficacy because it doesn't only tell you what you can do, but exactly how much impact your behavior will be, which is the kind of thing, you know, the audience says, oh, when I do this, it helps in this way. And then finally, for the term module, where we say use this term instead of another one, or in this specific case, if you want to show climate change in this perspective. We say, for example, that climate catastrophe in political discourse, the term is mostly used to convey disaster morality, political conflict, and response efficacy negative frames. And although it's not frequently used because it isn't, the Green Party applies the term and frame for blah, and the Liberal Democrats use the frame it for something else. So that's the basic idea. Thank you very much, and thank you for conceding me this final minute to explain the last thing. Yes, thank you for this very interesting presentation. Yeah, unfortunately, well, we'll discuss further over lunch, I think. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so let's prepare for the next speaker now. Sort out the technical difficulties. Sorry about that.